Okay, uh, so let's get started. I'm so happy to be back. Uh, thank you everyone for coming to the crit uh, Critique Hour uh, live stream. I really appreciate it when you guys attend. It feels like, you know, a, a real class. It feels like a live class. I don't do offline recordings because I like promoting the class feel. Um, so please come to the the, 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 <laughs> the live streams whenever you can. The recordings are up for anyone who's limited by time zone or schedule. Um, like school or work, um, but for anyone who can attend, I really appreciate it when you do. It means the world to me. Thank you so much to everyone who's here right now. Um, to start off, I uh, have a couple of announcements. There will be a 50% off Portrait Studio sale at the end of May or start of June. Um, so, uh, uh, Chloe, hi. Uh, it's been so long. Um, so yeah, for anyone who doesn't have Portrait Studio, I'll be sending out some promotional videos as well very soon, uh, but 50% off if you can wait. Um, two months to get it. Please do wait 50% off. That's uh, $80. So um, that's a good amount of money um, We're almost 50% off. I'm not sure if it's been decided, uh, but it's definitely between 45% uh, and 50% off um, uh, starting June and possibly end of May um, and that will also come hand in hand with an with a overhaul update that includes a lot of stuff um, I will make a special video detailing what this stuff is. There is also a villain design challenge for the community right now. Um, so for anyone who has not seen that, please join Reddit. If you don't know how to get to the Reddit link, just go to istabrak.com and click on the little Reddit, a little Reddit icon right here. It'll hop you over into Reddit. Please join. Um, it's very easy to use it. Very, very straightforward. Possibly one of the easiest websites to use. Um, and uh, it's not at all very d uh, difficult to add your, your pictures, your posts. I see everything. Everyone's pretty much getting the hand of it. Ha uh, the, uh, hand of it. Is that right? That sounds wrong. Um, and uh, yeah, I will also no longer be automatically tweeting live streams. So if you're depending on Twitter to get notifications for live streams, Twitter and YouTube don't have that anymore. They're not linked anymore. Um, and there's no auto tweet as well when I go live. So I'll be trying my best to make announcements here on Twitter, on Facebook manually, um, which is going to be a pain in the butt, uh, but it's just making sure that everyone who wants to join in the live stream um, has a, 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 an announcement available to them. Um, if you are a Facebook or Twitter user, the best thing you can do is just, just use Reddit. Um, I'm very, very active there. I'm more active there um, than I am with Facebook. And if you've been on Facebook and you um, sent me a message and you've been left on red, it's most likely my team that has looked at that, not me. I, I don't check Facebook that often. I have been trying very, very hard to, especially in my time off. I've been trying very hard to make sure I, I make, I'm, I'm accessible in all the, all the uh, websites I use. Um, what other announcements are there? If you want to join as a patron, please do. It helps out a great deal. Um, so on Patreon, we've just finished the, the, the Villain Design Challenge. The, the submissions were amazing. I'll be uploading a, a preview of them. These are all the submissions. I'll be uploading a preview of them on uh, my Twitter very soon, as soon as the, the artists are done with their corrections. Just to show you guys a quick preview, but um, it's a wonderful place for you to learn. It's an alternative to private tutoring, and it's only $20 tier compared to the 60 or 70 I charge an hour for private tutoring. So it's definitely a more affordable alternative. It isn't one-on-one -on -one private tutoring, of course. It's with a team. Um, but you have a lot of alternative homework apart from the heavy-duty uh, assignments that I send out, which are full-on character designs or book cover designs. You have form studies that you can pull from, portrait studies, and lots of other stuff. We are doing a very intensive costume and gesture study coming up for May, so if you want to get into that, or April, sorry. So if you want to get into that, uh, join us as an apprentice. Any lower tiers do get some educational material, and then one piece is taken off for the lower you go. So it goes down to the full JPEGs, PSDs, all of the um, uh, brushes that I use for my paintings, and educational, fully, full commentary, time lapse of all of my personal work, um, be it a study or a full on illustration. And of course, for apprentices, you have assignments, you have a monthly assignment stream to join where I correct all of the assignments and you have the discord and a lot of critique and community critique there. Um, so you get a lot more than you give and um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it means the world for you guys to support me that way. 
Um, and that's it. If you guys are taking good notes, there's a place to post your notes so you can get free brushes. And really, really good note takers get a portrait of cop a copy of Portrait Studio for free. Um, for anyone who wants to uh, send in notes and you can just submit them to the class notes category right here So for anyone who doesn't have Portrait Studio or my brushes and would like a copy do some good notes and by good notes I mean some really good notes um, uh, So hundred dollars or more in, uh, in awards needs good notes um, And uh, that's what I'm looking for. So let's get started on today Okay um, so what I'm seeing here, um, what I'm going to be looking at, first of all, I want to congratulate this 14-day challenger, um, and I will also be talking about very similar form issues um, moving throughout, but what I wanted to talk about here is something that we don't really talk about a lot, which is mapping out cast shadows, um, especially when you have a reference and how to take that over. But before I get into that, um, Congratulations on completing your 14-day challenge. Amazing improvement. Looks like a person I know. Looks very human. Here, yeah, there's something human about him, but uh, it just feels a bit disconnected, more like a humanoid. Uh, you distance the separation between the eyes. Uh, really, really well done. There are some issues, though, uh, but yes, for anyone who does a 14-day challenge, um, and if I see it, I will be... Um, giving you a free critique for like a complete critique in the critique hours. So if you are looking for that, um, to complete your 14 day challenge, push to the 14th day and you get a complete critique in the uh, critique hour. One of the things that feels off about this is the width of the eyes. Um, they are a little bit, I mean, not the distance between the eyes, the actual eye itself feels a little bit elongated. Okay. There's also, um, the width of the nose is fine, but it feels a little bit like the position of the nose and the septum is way too balanced. Usually the septum is lower, and he looks like he has quite a bridge. So unless it is completely flat, the septum and the nostrils do not sit on the same line. Okay, very muscular. Just be aware that you are drawing a very specific trope here. All right, so before... After just a little bit more accuracy as you can see you had that really long eye that really long width to the eye and that kind of added that unusual separated alien elf like uh, which you can get away with if you were actually drawing an elf but um, for it to look more human you have to be careful with that but a very very good job on the improve wow like the the cheekbones what you've done with the cheekbones cheekbones are read is a little bit feminine but you do have that slant inward c shape here for females it's an outward c shape so this is a feminine cheekbone and this is a masculine cheekbone so you kind of got away with it but try to stay away from that outward bump in the cheekbone there it's a little bit uh feminine so i'm just going to use liquify for that Talking that in. But the commentary video for this month's Patreon, um, uh, my personal work, is going to be about painting without access to liquify um, and how I managed to kind of get through that and my thoughts on that. So if you're interested in that, um, uh, two of the high, the two highest tiers are, are going to be offering that reward. And thank you to everyone who's joined as a patron, who's given uh, my apprenticeship a chance. I hope you guys have gotten what you wanted out of it. But do join the live streams if you guys can. There were many people in the live stream today. Alright, so I'm getting rid of that cheekbone. And again, before, after, a little less of that extra. And uh, just rounding things off more realistically. If male eyes tend to have a slant that is so it does it is a feminine eye but because you have a masculine eyebrow masculine head shape masculine mouth and nose you are it is reading as masculine so he is hot um the term hot or a hot guy or a hot character is pretty much just having girly eyes with really low eyebrows um that's it and you can have a hot guy who doesn't have large lower eyelids or a deep set eye socket but a deep set eye socket is very feminine when you layer that on top of masculine features it's not androgynous it's straight masculine 
but it is reading as hot. Uh, so the reason why he's hot, if anyone's wondering, is because not only because of his complete masculine self, but uh, because of his lower eyelid size here and the squint in the eyes and that deep set feminine eye socket. So look at what happens when we kind of get rid of the eye socket and the lower eyelid. All right, so same amount of handsomeness, but a little bit less hot. And if we squint that, so just so you guys can place that well in your in your visual library and categorize that accordingly. So just a more of a hooded eye. Not so like not so much Asian, just hooded because of that low brow bone and that lower eyelid. Sometimes the lower eyelid is completely gone. And you can see the eye has shrunken in size. A small eye is a le less hot guy, quote unquote. All right, let's move into this. Beautiful job on your 14 day challenge, excellent work. Move on to the female if you haven't done one yet. If you have done both, do a three quarter view male and female. Start with a female, move on to, into male. It's good to know, um, no, it's good to jump in between the genders so you don't always know how to draw only one gender. Um, so I'm grayscaling this so that we can look at your work exactly. So let's see what you did. You, you, what's bothering me is that this student saw the bounce light before they saw the edge work. Why? Why does that happen? Um, when a student sees something like as, as difficult to catch as bounce light up here, but can see, you know, uh, but can't see, a, a sharp cast shadow. Their cast shadow is really blurry, really messy, but they thought it important to prioritize this bounce light, which is way off after we grayscaled. What could be the cause? What could be doing this? So I'm professionally curious sometimes. I'm actually just, I don't know what, why a student sees certain things and doesn't. I can only guess. <clears throat> and then hopefully by assigning different um, types of assignments, that tackle the possible source of this problem, I can fix it and remedy it, even if I don't know exactly why a student, this happens to a student. What hap one of the things, one of the reasons why this could have happened is that they weren't grayscaled. And when I tell you, please use grayscale when you're drawing, I mean it, I mean that there is an actual reason for this. You are entering a blind zone when you are using color when you don't have any business using color because using color is something you graduate into. You don't have the skill set or the foundation knowledge yet to be at, even discussing things in color because right now, even on grayscale, you are not reading your values properly. You have a blind spot. You have a blind spot and you're expected to perform like you have a 2020 vision. This is just not possible. This is a ridiculous task to take on. If you can't see, you don't take on tasks that require sight, and that's it. You are blind in certain ways. How do you fix that blindness? Well, work so that you are remedying and supplementing all that missing knowledge so that when you move into color, you are not skipping really vital, critical measurements of contrast and, and bounce light and edge work. I mean, edge work is everything to do with the success of a painting. Edge work and radial shading are, are your bread and butter. They are with... with, with which you, they are what with which you draw. Um, and when you are messing around like this with these random ass, some areas have super sharp cast shadow, some areas have more painterly, and then you're trying to do the painterly thing, maybe a painterly painting inspired you. Again, it's not going to be a measure of your skill if you paint painterly. It's, you're not there yet. Uh, painting painterly means you are aware of all the rules and have decided which ones to break Painting painterly means you have the accuracy to measure which brush strokes are more critical than others that you rush those and then having the right brush size and the right placement and accuracy with your um, uh, brush respective to the object it's representing so you don't have to blend it. It's just doing what it's doing when it's left raw. That is a, lo a lot goes into painting painterly that you're just not ready for yet. So you're not ready for color and you're not ready for painterly paintings. All I want to see if I was your teacher and I am all I want to see is that clean cast shadow. Respect the cast shadow. The cast shadow is the same thing as the core shadow. It's just one is more of a casting its shape of the origin object and one the shadow is wrapping around because it's not 
in rejecting the light enough as a cast, as a cast image, taking on the shape of what's cast in it. Sorry, one moment, I'm just gonna cough. So what's happening here is your bounce light is just too strong. And another reason, another thing that I could possibly guess of why a student is failing so hard when it comes to just measuring a simple contrast and, and keeping a simple clean edge could be because of their brush. Their brush could be short and small. So let's take a look at the most basic large brush requirement and look at what we see here. We see three different size brushes. We see this size, we see this size right here, and we see this size. These could be the same size. We see a bunch of thin brush strokes, which could be one other size. We see a pretty large brush stroke, see that? So what we're talking about constant size changes. You have the source of the information right here. What are you doing changing the size of your brush? So there's a technique problem. So it could be a technique. It could be taking on things that you're just simply not ready for. It could be a cockiness, like an instilled sense of student enthusiasm. It's not really bad cockiness. I just say it's enthusiasm. It could be um, that you just don't have anatomy knowledge, when, a form anatomy knowledge, I mean. Um, and because of that, you're, you're, you're getting confused um, and you don't know what to prioritize and you think, oh, I just have to outline the eye and things will be done. You may have recently shed the line, and this is one of your first attempts at edge work, so you don't even know that you're seeing an edge. It could be just a complete blind spot. So there's a lot of reasons why, um, uh, I mean, it also could be because you rushed color. I don't know if I said that yet. Um, yes, that color that you saw in the reference, yes, it was block, even if it was sepia and single tone, that was color. You should not be seeing any grayscale completely. It doesn't matter if it's a tone of a, of, a, of, a, of a singular tone of a color, it's still color because what you're trying to do is work with the color as well as work with the shade. When you only have grayscales between black and white, you don't have to worry about which color you're using right and copying it down properly. Moving into color is so much less painful when you have a good background of, of form knowledge. So again, it could be a lot of these things, but I really want to stress how problematic it is that you had such attention paid to balance light and maybe because the saturation captured your eye and such little attention paid to your edges. Your edges are so much more important. If you're a new student, if you're a student new to my work um, and my classes, you know very well how much I stress the importance of edges. Um, and when I see an edge this week, it is something that I go at aggressively if this was private tutoring. I, I do not let up until I see that your edges are as clean as required and a cast shadow such as this one with such a strong nearby environment light, it, it is not forgivable that, that the edges are, are, are secondary or tertiary in your priorities. Okay, so what am I doing? I'm doing this exact just precision application with a large hard uh, edge brush squared brush of all of these areas and if it's not the exact temperature if the, if the, um, the, the, the value is wrong it doesn't matter right now and if you're if you're doing color you're worrying about value you're worrying about edge and uh, sharpness and you're worrying about the right temperature so it's 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 just too much for a big beginner to take care of and, and students that have this kind of a weak edge I base them as I reference them as beginners I feel like they don't have enough mileage or knowledge or technique and those three things if all these three things are lacking you are a beginner somewhere down the line with enough at least the most basic form studies um, pick you out of technical um, beginnerness so it means that you're a beginner even with your form studies. I wouldn't call someone who does form studies a beginner, not at all. So I'm just diffusing the temperature here. I'm actually going to just use a lighten. So sorry about my voice, it's really falling apart now. <coughs> okay, so another really important edge um, that we're talking about here so the edge of a cast shadow is a really important edge. Um, it's one of the most important edges that you can think about, but that's not really um, a new kind of edge. There's only two kinds of edges. 
um, where one object starts and another begins, um, meaning that it's the, the guy's head against the background. That should be completely sharp. Look at that sharpness. And then there's a fold, an interior fold. So the fold of the wrinkle right here, that's an edge. So you look out for these two, two types. I would say cast shadow is just one object starting and another beginning, but because it's a cast shadow, we can give it its own category. But there are technically only two kinds of edges in the physical world. Okay. So what I'm doing here is I'm trying to just find the exact shape and then managing the temperature of this cast shadow in between the two. There isn't much black at all because it's one concrete kind of, well, concrete or marble type of clay thing used for the material here. So the reason why this is high resolution is because we can see that clean edge and what we're doing when we're bringing in edges is we're including resolution. So we have the eyelid right here. The eyelid has the thickness to it. And that's what I'm adding. As you can see, I'm ready to shrink my brush. I don't care about what's inside the cast shadow right now. The, the cast shadow is a thing on its own that needs to have its own consideration separate from other things. I do find gradients, so the gradient of the brow bone, the globular shape of the brow bone, right here. Okay, so I'm starting to smudge. Other areas where you've completely thrown off the priority between cast shadow edge and bounce light is right here. Bounce light just does not come first. All right, and the temperature itself is way too dark for that cast shadow, so I'm using lighten. Just throwing that up there. All right, so we're kind of entering a cleaner, cleaner uh, plate here, and I'm going to start fixing the contrast everywhere else. And again, there's a general tone to his skin. This guy is more pale than this guy. And you didn't pick that up because you're using color and you, did, you didn't understand what you were doing with that color. Okay, so I'm cleaning up the separation between upper and lower lip. And if you're thinking, hey, this is too clean for me, that's the problem with you right now. Um, if this technique, if this thing is too clean for you, then it's just like saying, eh, I don't want to use formulas in math class. I think I'm just going to wing it, see what I can do without all the planning. It's not planning. It's the science itself. You need the formula to, to solve the equation. This is the same thing here. If this method is too clean a study habit for you, you're still a beginner, even in your thinking. But if you're mature enough to know, hey, I, maybe I do need to need to organize the way I'm approaching these studies. I can't just go willy-nilly into anything. I have to know, you know, am I ready for these for these more advanced studies? Am I ready for color? Did I really spend enough time on color so that I could, um, you know, just uh, do, or did I spend enough time on grayscale so I can pull off color with effortlessly? And I've taught so many students and I'm telling you, you will improve so much more fast. You will see a general improvement in your portfolio so much more quickly when you start separating and fragmenting your learning process. You, you're, you're, you're in a constant fight with your brain's desire to just not draw. Um, and if your brain is, is used to having these flat images given to it and you needing only the flat image, um, then it's not going to give you the three-dimensional image. You are teaching your brain to think three-dimensionally. Right, so what you can see I'm doing here is I'm cleaning up anywhere where I have these blended areas by using my smudge tool. Please use your, your smudge tool to blend. It's the more realistic way of reorganizing value. <clears throat> See these temperature changes? Now I have to start looking out for those. And I'm going to be doing that 
with a soft brush. Sorry, my landlord called me. <laughs> he usually doesn't call me in my class hours, but because I was on vacation, he possibly thought I was changing my schedule or something. All right, so I'm dropping all of the light here, every last bit, and I'll be blocking in where I really need it. And just take a look at what measuring and cleaning up your edges does for you. It looks great. And we've only just cleaned edges. That's all we've done. Blend it a little bit as well. Uh, one question that students ask me is how do I know how much detail to preserve and how much det detail to try to copy from my reference? If the detail is little bumps and bruises like this, don't even bother. If it's edge work and all of that stuff, if it's tiny little wrinkles that are not tiny enough to be used with a tiny pixel brush, but um, large enough to be used, maybe like a medium sized brush or medium small, then try to try to get those details. So all these scratches, no, but this little bridge of light above the eyebrow, yeah, I would go for that. Okay, so I'm trying to, squinting your eyes is an amazing trick to capture whether or not or it is just to figure out whether or not you're using the right value and to capture the right highlights. And then I've got a little guy right there, not too bright. All right, and when you squint your eyes, you shouldn't be able to tell the difference between your piece and the reference. That's what you're going for. At the squint level, they are the same thing. All right, there's a little brush stroke right there. If it's too bright, that's okay. Just like so. Right, a lot of brightness here on the brow bone. Not that much, more of a mid-tone really, but because of the edge work, it raises brighter. So mid-tones look brighter when there is an edge nearby. Write that back to me. As you can see, it becomes almost irrelevant to even worry about the eyes. But because you guys are so used to rushing the eyes in your work, you're so concerned with the eyes. The eyes have to be completed. There has to be tons of black used there. And it's really not the case. So I'm throwing in those temperature changes right there. Slight little bounce lights that are more regional than specific actual rim light. And then I've got really beautiful radial shading sitting around the corners of the mouth. And if you do have, a, you know, if you see enough bounce light and you have to include it, wait, it's an accessory. It's not more important than the core shadow. Scientifically, chronologically, if we were to measure it scientifically, the core shadow happened before the bounce light. The first, the first ray of light emerged and then the bounce light as the second thing that happened. So, it's the accessory, it's the little extra thing that happened along the way. And I'm just blending as I go. There's a little brightness here for the upper part of the other eyebrow. And a little kind of shadow for the dome of the frontal lobe. Right there. And then you've got these kind of outlines that really make no sense. I'm losing my voice, so I might cut this a little short today. But I'm just combining um, this area up here. And then you're missing a temple light, completely missing one. A shadow, sorry, a temple shadow. Again, I'm using darken. And there's the edge of the cheekbone, which isn't dark enough. And I'm just going to do a quick outline for that with, this, with the right temperature. And then the key with outlining, uh, the way to clean it up is to blend one half of the brush stroke, leave the edge on the other side. It's not perfect, that's fine. I'm just going to flip the canvas, see what I'm not seeing. There's that little brightness there. <coughs> And then we've got the cash and a sharpness of the nose against the cash shadow of the other eye. That's a very big one. Beautiful guy here. And then I'm getting rid of that 
I mean, he does have a bit of an outline, sort of illusion of an outline happening. All right, and just take a look at these clean edges. These are the edges that matter. All right, so for the nose, the geometry of the nose is that we have an outline like that, and then we have the bridge for the top of the prism, so I'm gonna get pretty strong value here, just to average out the top of the nose. And then equivalent purpose for the other side. And this is what, this is a bit too dark and that's okay, I just averaged it out, I can brighten it up if I need to. You can actually see the line where that happens. A lot of the mouth area is going to be blended, um, so be prepared for that. And if you don't have a good smudge tool, you're really going to have a hard time figuring that out with your hard round. All right, so there are some areas that are just smudged, so I decrease the size of my smudge brush to figure those areas out, like the top of the hair. None of the cast shadows are getting blended, though top of the hair of the eyebrow. This is kind of a convex, concave shape right there. Oh man, my voice is gone. I'm trying to make sure all of the ends of these make sense. And then when you're ready to start including new information, you have an excellent plate for this. So all the new information, the nostrils, will be done with a very, very um, well-measured value that still respects the core shadows within which these values, these bounce lights are, are, are visible. Because these bounce lights, though they are bounce light, they are still super dark. Look, at, I'm choosing the bounce light value and I'm using it in the light areas. Do you, do you see any difference? There's actually no difference when you're not combining them, when they don't meet. Looks like the same value but there's a very distinct difference here. And if you must, use your black shadow value for anywhere where obviously we have real need for black, which is cavities, black like little tiny holes, nostril cavity here in this case. And then what needs blending should be blended halfway. Half the brush stroke is blended out. Hope this kind of woke you up to maybe some of the issues you're facing for the artist here in question. And for anyone who's watching who suffers from the same issues, I hope this has kind of reminded you to grayscale for a little while before you try kind of figuring out your way around a, a colored piece. I mean, we're grayscaling for years. Just to, just to like give you a good idea of how important grayscaling is, it's, it's done for years maybe a good year or two before color is attempted. There's just way too much form for you to be trying, um, for you to learn, and so much of your brain's bad habits for you to correct that working with color is just is, is too early if you haven't even figured out a proper approach to, to, to edge work alone. And I'm just zooming out, trying to assess how sharp other edges really need to be. And if it's perfectly polished, that's fine. It's better than not having clean edges, right? Show off your edge work so that you don't get in trouble with your teacher. Don't use painterly as an excuse to get out of work or, oh, the skill is there, I'm just trying paint. No, that doesn't work, that doesn't fly here. Either show off your edge work or you don't have edge work or you don't know edge work. Because the light is top down, it's mostly the top of the forehead that has more brightness. So look at the average of the top of the forehead compared to the nose, which is a little bit low on average. Top of the forehead, look at the little guy. And this is the average. And then the nose, it's a significant drop in average. So that's because the nose isn't in that lighting where it's 45 degrees and pointing directly at the nose. The nose really wouldn't be that bright. And then now if you want to add that bounce light, 
We add it in with a very, very low opacity salt brush, really just barely there. And that's exactly how it is in the real world. base of every lip, the bottom of the lip, the bottom of the jaw. Okay, and then sometimes I'll just uh, mess around and kind of make eye, eye bags more dark than they really are, just to bring in more of a distinguished touch. And for every hill there's a valley, so... Oh my god, my voice is gone. <laughs> Bringing in some necessary contrast where it sits, and uh, I need to probably clean that out, but I would work on cleaning out the jowls first. And these are the detail things where I'd have to zoom up or zoom in and uh, shrink my brush. And this would be like the, the largest stretch of time. Even though it takes a long time to do details, doesn't mean details are more important. Um, the most important thing is the thing that takes probably the least amount of time, which is your blocking in. It's ironic, but these are the weird truths. A lot of the work can be done zoomed out. Anything that needs zooming in, hold out on it. Okay, as for the likeness, um, I do encourage you guys to get likeness. His face seems a little bit more regal, more more um, pronounced, where this guy's face is a little nondescript. I feel like I know this person, but not really this person. I'm trying to capture the likeness. Nose is a little bit bigger. There are cheekbones, but not that strong. <clears throat> okay. And then I would just uh, make sure that the lower half of the greater beard shadow is there. And that's just the light source doing its thing. So let's take a look at the before and after. Before. After. Okay. So this is what's happening with your work. You're trying color too early. And it's not letting you see the truth of the form, which is all in the cast shadow of the eye socket here. There's a lot of that um, contrast that's missing, and that's fine because we still have a lot of detail to do. Okay, so I hope you have a you know good idea of what to do next with your with your with your uh, brush strokes, what to do next with your studies, um, what to prioritize in the painting process, grayscaling. Getting yourself a nice hard edged brush. I have a great one in my brush sets in the uh, dry oil brush set, but if you have one, you can make one as well. Um, and then uh, um, choosing better subject matter. I think a male older face is something for a later time. Try to learn your way around blocking in a female face so you can perfect that. It is the most com commercially um, in demand and then move into handsome young male, and then middle-aged into old, and then young into baby. And that way you're working in a very um, applicable way. Instead of jumping from age, group, and gender, you're perfecting one at a time so that your portfolio has a definable skill in there that you can see as your main talent. And that therefore you can be uh, entering the employment world a lot sooner than if you were just sporadically choosing one small thing to be good at or if you do random age groups and genders you're improving only a little bit with each topic instead of using all your power to improve with one um, I'm happy to be back thank you everyone for for attending today I promise I'll try to have classes have a little bit more length and variety as we go from here. I am very, very sick nowadays. Um, I'm trying to stay on top of everything. I did, I did improve a lot with my time off, definitely. Um, but uh, but I, f I felt like I needed a little bit longer, but that flu kind of took the little bit longer that I needed anyway, and I spent it sick, and I wasn't going to add another week of absence away from classes. 
Um, look out for that Portrait Studio sale in two months. And April 30th, the Villain Design Challenge is due. So if you want to, a chance to win Portrait Studio, some free sessions with me, um, I'm still not 100% sure on the exact type of rewards I'll be giving out. But if enough people join, it'll be enough of a contest. And I will definitely make a nice community poll for you guys to vote on for the winners after I choose the semifinalists. Um, thank you everyone for coming. I'm really happy to be back. Thank you everyone for being here. Bye.